The Amish people are a close-knit, family-focused community that lives simply without the bells and whistles of modern technology. Now, we all know that there's crime everywhere, but in this community, violent crime is incredibly rare. Yet, some of the most dangerous evildoers in America have used this group to hide in plain sight while committing terrible crimes under cover of darkness. I'm Amy, and this is True Crime Recaps, the podcast. If you've got less than an hour, this is the show for you. Amy and I are bringing you twice the crime in half the time every week. Today, we want to tell you about three of the most violent criminals in Amish history, starting with the first traditional Amish man to be found guilty of homicide, Ed Gingrich. When EMTs responded to a call about a disturbed male on the Gingrich farm in Mill Village, Pennsylvania, they figured they knew what it was all about. A year earlier, they'd shown up to find 28-year-old Ed Gingrich howling like a dog, cackling about giant rabbits and God and the devil fighting for his soul. It took a handful of grown men to get him into restraints that time. He'd been hospitalized for his psychotic delusions twice, and they thought maybe he'd gone off his medication again. They braced themselves for a repeat performance. But when they pulled up, they saw Ed walking calmly toward them with his three-year-old daughter and four-year-old son in tow. The only sign that something might not be quite right was the sight of his swollen hand. But the kids weren't crying, and they could hear Ed saying something about how his people would understand everything, according to the Buffalo News. Still, the caller that had got them there said, He's killing his wife up there. So they weren't planning on leaving until they went up to the house and checked on her. The assistant fire chief will never forget what he saw when he pushed open the front door on March 18, 1993. Katie Gingrich was on the floor laying on her back. Her clothes were stacked in a neat pile beside her body. It looked like she'd been gutted. Her internal organs were on the floor near her clothes. A small kitchen knife sat beside them. They'd been pulled from her body through a jagged seven-inch gash. Her skull was crushed so badly that her features were unrecognizable. Even worse, her three-year-old and four-year-old children had seen their father do it. Katie had just enough time to tell her oldest son, a five-year-old, to run to the neighbors for help. The community Katie and Ed lived in, with 26 other Amish families, was isolated from the outside world. The closest city was Erie, Pennsylvania, more than 20 miles away. Ed was one of 11 children. His father was a minister. Katie was also from a big family. She was one of 16 kids, and her uncle was a bishop. The marriage between them seemed to make sense, and for Katie, who was already in her late 20s when she said, I do to Ed, in her mind, she felt like he might be her last chance to be a wife and a mother. Ed supported the family with his skill for mechanics. He operated a sawmill and repaired engines so well, he was known as a master mechanic. As good as he was with moving parts, she was with her garden. Only a few days before the attack, she told family how much she was looking forward to spring planting. Her garden and her children were the joys of her life. Her husband was another matter. Ed had long had problems. Even as a child and teenager, he strained against the Amish ways and talked about going to live with the English in Erie. But his family thought a marriage to a good Amish woman like Katie would help calm him down and sort him out. Instead, his mental issues got worse by the year. This wasn't something Katie felt comfortable talking about. His family knew, of course, but she stayed quiet and tried to keep his problems between themselves, hoping that prayer would put an end to it once and for all. There were times that Ed would go berserk and all she could do was send for his brothers. Sometimes he'd have to be tied down. Other times he'd bark like a dog or scream that he saw the devil. Once he escaped out a window and fled into the night while his family chased him down in a horse and buggy. He often complained that his skin was crawling and his brain felt like it might boil over. But each time he was hospitalized and given medication, he would stop taking it. And before too long, he got worse. Two days before he savagely attacked his wife, a non-Amish neighbor noticed that he wasn't looking too good. 
Ed's eyes were glassy and sort of spacey, he said to the Buffalo News later. For the last month, he'd been complaining about hearing voices that interrupted his sleep. But when he started talking about taking his own life, his friend thought he'd better drive him to a doctor to have him looked at. The family suggested that he take him to a doctor they knew, almost 100 miles away. And the whole family piled into the car to come along. The trip took hours through the snow with Ed moaning about the pain he had in his head the whole way. But when they finally arrived, the specialist they'd driven all that way to see wasn't a medical doctor at all. It was an Amish herbalist that prescribed him natural remedies. On the way home, his friend told the Buffalo News that he was lethargic and quiet. Katie offered to bake him bread to repay him for the ride. They didn't get home until almost 3 a.m. and the family was exhausted. That was the last time he saw Katie alive. Later that day, Ed had an appointment with his regular practitioner 15 miles away, a chiropractor who advertised his services as drugless therapy. For the last six months, he'd been treating Ed for sleeplessness, nervous sweating and rage issues with a combination of scalp manipulation and black strap molasses. Ed and Katie and one of the kids got a ride there with a non-Amish man they knew who needed some help with his foot pain. On the way there, Ed said again that he wanted to end it all. The chiropractor responded by giving him a scalp massage. On the way back to the house, the others started talking about a wedding dinner that night for an Amish couple in their community. It was decided that Ed should stay home and rest under the watchful eyes of his brother while Katie drove herself and the kids there in the family's buggy. On the way, she was planning to stop and pick up Ed's sister to join them. According to court testimony published by the Buffalo News, Ed woke up angry from a nap that afternoon. He wanted to go to the wedding, and the sight of his wife happily humming to herself as she washed the dishes before she left him at home alone sent him into a rage. He knocked her down, then went out on the porch to get his steel-tipped boots he used for farm work. Katie told her five-year-old son to go for help, but the nearest house was half a mile away. Before anyone could get there, Ed kicked the life out of her. Then he disemboweled her to release the devil from her body, in his words. He was arrested without incident an hour later. In jail, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. And I want to be clear here. A diagnosis like that absolutely does not automatically mean someone is dangerous. But in this case, Ed was violent and susceptible to rage-filled delusions. In his interrogation later, his conversation with police was disjointed and nonsensical. This excerpt of that conversation was taken from information reported by Dave Lore on Crime Library. Ed started by telling the police this, For some reason, I think we could still save her. No, we cannot save her. Katie is dead, and you know Katie is dead, the investigator replied. Yeah, I know. Why did I kill her? I felt it was a gain. A gain for who? A gain for us people, Ed replied. All the people? Yeah, not just my religion. Why? Because if I can get back on track, it will come yet. Maybe you can explain to me why you felt you had to remove Katie's brain and work your way from the brain down. Explain that to me. You know how we, the human being, were made? Yes, the investigator replied, from the top down. That's right. I had it in my mind that if I worked from the top down, Ed paused and then said, I'm so lost. I don't know what to say. For her burial, instead of dressing her in her wedding gown, as was tradition, her mother and sisters wrapped Katie's body in black linen and laid her in a pine coffin. In 1994, he was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter by reason of mental illness and sentenced to only five years. He served his time in the prison ward of a mental hospital, according to the Buffalo News. However, if he had been found not guilty by reason of insanity, he would have been hospitalized indefinitely, which may ultimately have been better for Ed and the community, according to former FBI special agent Jim Fisher, who is the author of a book about this case called Crimson Stain. In his words, published by the Buffalo News, when you imprison someone like that and they serve their time, they are released without condition 
and their treatment is left up to them. Eventually, almost all of them quit taking their medication and they relapse. In Ed's case, that could mean violence. And he certainly wasn't the only person hoping that Ed could get the care he needed away from the community he'd traumatized with his crime. Nearly 60 of his friends, neighbors, and family signed a petition asking for him to be permanently committed, saying, We like Ed Gingrich, but absolutely don't trust him and are seriously afraid of him. He was released in 1998 and transferred to an Amish mental health facility in Michigan. After that, he was moved to another mental health unit in Indiana, designed to offer patients like him constant supervision. But with medication, he was getting better, feeling more like his old self, and he wanted to see his children and the rest of his family. However, he'd been banned from his community after slaughtering Katie. In February 2007, he rented a home nearby his former house and made an effort to stick to his medication and therapy. According to the Buffalo News, two of his brothers and his two sons, teenagers by this time, forgave him and for their trouble, they were also shunned in the community. According to the same article by Tim Moriarty and Michael Ruane, quote, Divisions over his presence back in the community were so powerful that when his sons tried to attend a youth prayer meeting after being shunned for their relationship with him, they were arrested for defiant trespass. Two months after he came back to the area, he kidnapped his 17-year-old daughter. She'd been living with her grandparents and she wasn't allowed to see him. As you can imagine, the first thought on everyone's mind was that she would meet the same fate as her mother. But five days later, she was found safe and sound. He said he only wanted to see her again before she turned 18 and was required to join the church and shun him along with the rest of the congregation. To the crime of kidnapping her, he pleaded no contest and was sentenced to six months probation and fined $500. A little more than a year later in February 2008, he served three months in jail for hunting with a rifle which he wasn't allowed to carry as a felon. Not long after that, his relationship with his family and teenage sons turned sour. They decided to go back to their lives in the community, and in exchange, they agreed to shun him. A rejection he felt so keenly, he moved in with some cousins in another town, but his reputation preceded him, and the neighbors made a big stink about such a violent criminal living in the area. Then, finally, in the summer of 2010, he moved in with his lawyer and his wife, not far from the Amish community he used to call home. But despite his many years away from them, his lawyer told Reuters they often found him stumbling around the house using a lamp, even though they encouraged him to use the light switch. In the words of his friend and lawyer, he was Amish to the end. At first, he was doing well. A nurse came every two weeks to inject him with antipsychotic drugs, and he was taking other medication on his own. Or so they thought. In December, he fell into a deep depression, but they watched him closely looking for signs of delusions and rage. They didn't see any, but they did learn that their worst fear had happened. Ed had stopped taking his medication again. On January 14th, 2011, he went to the barn to feed the horse. After five hours went by and he still hadn't returned to the house, his lawyer's wife went out to check on him. She found him hanging from the second floor. Forgive me, please, was written in the dust on a bucket, according to Reuters. He was buried next to Katie, a depressing ending to a tragic story. Next on our list of terrifying Amish villains is Eli Stutzman, an Amish man linked to four bodies. If you happen to be looking at a copy of Reader's Digest in January 1988, you might have read the strange story of a nine-year-old boy abandoned in a ditch next to a cornfield in the tiny town of Chester, Nebraska on Christmas Eve in 1985. His frozen little body was dressed only in thin blue sleeper pajamas. He was partially covered with snow. Despite several autopsies, no one could figure out how he might have lost his life or who might have taken it. The sheriff thought he'd been strangled pointing to marks on his neck, but the medical examiner said no. The marks were from the freezing temperatures. 
It was decided that he may have been smothered, but officially it was inconclusive. His face was disfigured from animal activity in the field he was found in, so the local police had to improvise a sketch to try and identify him. But for years, no one came forward. A month after a passerby happened to spot him from the highway, the townspeople came together to take care of the strange boy that no one seemed to want to claim as their own. One person donated a cemetery plot. The funeral home offered their services for free, and other residents pooled their money to buy a casket, flowers, a suit to bury him in, and a headstone. On it, they engraved the name Matthew, which they picked because it means gift from God. They left room for his real name to be added, trusting that someday they would know who this child was. More than 400 people, the entire town of Chester and then some, came to his funeral. As the weeks and months ticked by and no one stepped up to identify the little boy, the entire town adopted him as their own. His grave was never allowed to fall into ruin. Visitors stopped by and frequently left flowers and toys for him, a memorial not just for the strange boy that had found his way to their town, but to the town itself that had given so much of themselves to taking care of this child. And then, a little more than two years later, Reader's Digest ran the story of Little Boy Blue, as he'd been called because of his blue pajamas. And they made this strange story national news when they published the police artist's sketch of what they thought he may have looked like when he was alive. And finally, the mystery was solved. A woman in an Amish community in northern Ohio happened to see the story and wondered if Little Boy Blue might be a family member they hadn't seen in several years. Police compared the boy's fingerprints to a palm print of his on a school record, and suddenly he had a name. Danny Stutzman, the Amish son of Eli and Ida Stutzman from Dalton, Ohio. But where were his parents? Ida and Eli were married in 1975. Now, like many people in their community, they owned and worked on a dairy farm. Unlike many in their community, Eli had dark secrets and an even darker personality. He was a pathological liar who would do or say anything to get what he wanted. He was one of 13 children, raised in the Schwarzentruber Amish community, one of the strictest Amish orders in the country. His father was the bishop of their order and pressured his family to set a good example for others in the community. But it was soon clear that Eli was far from a humble, obedient Amish child. He dropped out of school in eighth grade, but told enough lies about his education to get a teaching certificate to teach school in the Amish community when he was 21. By the time he married Ida Gingrich, no relation to the Ed Gingrich you just heard about, Eli had been banned from and forgiven by the Amish community at least once before, but getting married to a woman was the last thing he had on his mind as a closeted gay man. In 1976, Ida gave birth to a blonde-haired little boy they named Daniel. Now, less than a year later, she was pregnant with their second child, but another baby? That is not what Eli wanted. He barely tolerated his wife and was often gone from the farm for hours at a time, even overnight. Ida was 26 years old and eight months pregnant in July 1977, when their barn mysteriously caught on fire in the middle of the night. Her body was found hours later. Both her and her unborn child were victims of smoke inhalation. When asked about the circumstances later, Eli's explanation changed several times, but the gist of his story was that Ida had gone into the barn to try and save some equipment from the fire and had gotten trapped inside. Luckily, he said, the day before the fire, she'd finalized her will, leaving everything to him. Local officers doubted that story, but they didn't investigate because of a lack of evidence and the fact that Eli was an Amish man, so surely he couldn't have been lying about what happened that night. In the words of his cousin, Eli hid behind his clothes a lot. It allowed him to get away with his bizarre lies and suspected homicide of his wife and unborn child. And after she died, Eli gave up all pretense of following the rules and customs of his community. He shaved his beard, he stopped going to church, and he started dabbling in raising racehorses. He and Danny left Ohio in 1982 and went to Durango, Colorado to live on a 58-acre farm he bought with an older boyfriend he'd met through the classifieds in The Advocate. 
That lasted less than a year before they broke up, and Eli bought out his share in the farm. Now, this was a pattern that persisted for the next three years across Colorado, Florida, and Texas. Eli supported himself and his son with construction work, horse wrangling, and some say drug dealing. According to a book on this case called Abandoned Prayers by Greg Olson, people that knew them suspected that Danny might be a victim of sexual abuse by his father and potentially other men. More than one person remembers Eli encouraging Danny to touch men in that way, saying he wanted to raise him to be a homosexual so he wouldn't have to deal with women. But whether or not the child was being abused was never officially confirmed either way, mainly because no one ever alerted the authorities about what was going on with Danny. After his son's body was identified, the Nebraska State Patrol went looking for Eli, and they weren't alone. He was also wanted for questioning in Texas in connection with another body found there, that of 24-year-old Glenn Pritchett, his former roommate from Austin. Now, Glenn Pritchett was one of many men to room with the father and son over the years after they left Ohio. In the mid-80s, Glenn was staying with Eli in Texas and doing construction work for him. The relationship between them was mostly platonic friends since Glenn claimed to be straight and he'd left behind an ex-wife and two kids in Montana. On May 12, 1985, he was found in a ditch outside of town. A bullet had gone through his left eye. Eli told everyone Glenn had gone back to Montana to visit his son, who was clinging to life in a hospital there. But that was just another lie from a man who'd been lying his whole life. Police questioned Eli and another roommate of his, but they didn't have the evidence they needed to file charges against him, although he was the main person of interest in the case for years. Not long after Glenn's body was discovered, Eli and Danny picked up and left town, headed west to friends in Lyman, Wyoming. A few weeks later, Eli moved on again, but he left his son behind with their host in Wyoming, saying he needed to travel for work and it wasn't a good environment for Danny. When they asked why he wouldn't want to leave his boy with his wife's people in the Amish community in Ohio, Eli claimed they were trying to take Danny from him, which of course was another lie. But instead of working his way across the country like he said he was doing, Eli found himself back in Durango, Colorado. Before he got there, the little town hadn't seen a violent crime in almost four years. Then, within the space of a few weeks, two bodies were found. According to a report in the Herald, a badly decomposing body with a severe head injuries was found on November 10, 1985. It was 36-year-old David Tyler, and he'd been left in the bed of his own truck outside the automatic transmission exchange where he worked as a mechanic and co-owner. Three weeks later, 24-year-old Dennis Slater was found in the basement of the liquor store where he worked. The place had been robbed and Dennis was executed at close range. Eli knew both men, and he was at a party with David Tyler two days before his body was found. At the time, police blamed the crimes on a drifter moving through town. But in 1987, after Eli was named as the father of this infamous little boy, Blue, they put the pieces together and realized that not only did he have a close connection with at least one of the victims, but only days after Dennis was found, Eli moved on again without a word. He's never been charged in those crimes, and those crimes have never been solved. From Durango, he planned to make his way back to Wyoming to pick up his son, but for what purpose? Author Greg Olson and others familiar with this case speculated that Danny may have seen Eli put a bullet in his former roommate's head. He may have been planning to get rid of Danny so there'd truly be no witnesses, or maybe he just didn't want to have his son around anymore. With that in mind, listen to this. Three days before he picked up his son on December 14, 1985, Eli wrote a letter to a boyfriend saying he'd be visiting him in Missouri for Christmas, but he wouldn't have his son with him. When he picked Danny up from his de facto foster parents, he said he was taking him back to Ohio for Christmas, but of course they never made it there. A picture of Danny and Eli standing near the Christmas tree was taken only days before his body was found. Later, when he visited family in Ohio, he told them Danny stayed in Wyoming to ski, and he let the boys' foster family in Wyoming believe that Danny was staying in Ohio. 
After months of searching, investigators found Eli in Azle, Texas, almost two years from the day he left Danny on the side of the road. He'd been working as a carpenter, but had never mentioned the fact that he had a son or a wife to any of his boyfriends or friends. He dropped out of sight after the news started running stories about Danny as the unidentified little boy Blue. An anonymous phone call tipped police to his location. He was hiding out in a trailer six miles out of town. An overnight stakeout led to his arrest, and he was sent back to face the music in Nebraska. The first thing he asked for was Grecian formula when he got to prison there. He wanted to keep his hair nice. He was a weird dude, according to an interview the Star-Telegram did with the sheriff at that time. During an interrogation, he claimed his son was taking antibiotics for a bad chest cold when he picked him up in Wyoming. He said he was sleeping in the back seat as they drove across Nebraska, and it wasn't until he stopped for gas that he noticed he, he wasn't breathing. Eli had worked in a hospital in his late teens, and he knew CPR, a skill he claimed he used to try and bring his son back, but couldn't. When he spoke up in his own defense in the courtroom, he said, I had difficulty facing the fact that he had died. I couldn't understand. I couldn't figure out why. I decided to leave him and let God take care of him. What the court didn't hear was that after leaving his nine-year-old covered with snow in a ditch on Christmas Eve, he kept going south to hook up with the boyfriend he'd told days earlier he'd be visiting alone without his son. Oh, obviously, he was lying about what happened to Danny, but without any forensic evidence or even a cause of death to prove it, he was only charged with felony child abuse. And in an effort to avoid the time and expense of a trial, he eventually pled guilty to misdemeanor charges of abandoning a body for which he only served a year in jail. But when he was released, eh, he didn't get far. Texas wanted him to answer for Glenn Pritchett. On July 31st, 1989, he was sentenced to 40 years in prison, but he only did 13 years before he walked free in March of 2002. And for the next five years, he lived in a small one-room apartment in Fort Worth, making and selling leather goods like purses and Bible covers. He was also doing a lot of crack, according to the Star-Telegram, and he didn't even really try to keep his drug use secret, but he did keep his past to himself. Instead, he told people he'd served time for drugs, and he told others that he was innocent of the charges he'd really been in prison for. And sometimes he claimed he'd never been married and had no kids. Other times he said his wife had passed away and he left his baby son in the care of his Amish family. I mean, even telling people that he'd visited the boy recently and they had a great relationship. In the months leading up to January 31st, 2007, his friends say that they noticed a change in him. He started giving his things away, or selling them, and he stopped paying rent. He told everyone he was moving to a new place, but around 4 p.m. on the 31st, a friend of his walked into his apartment and found him on the couch under a comforter. His wrists had been slashed. There was no note or confessions left behind. His Amish family decided not to claim his body, and he lay in the morgue for weeks before he was finally buried in a pauper's grave. He was 56 years old. And two years after Eli Stutzman took his final breaths, a self-described Amish stud from Apple Creek, Ohio, raised his ugly head. His name is also Eli, Eli Weaver. In early June of 2009, Eli's wife, Barbara Weaver, was shot in the heart while she slept, but no one in the house heard a thing. Eli had left at 3.30 a.m. to go fishing, an alibi that was supported by the friends he was with that morning. The biggest question on everyone's mind was why? Why would someone want to kill such a devout woman as Barbara Weaver? Let me walk you through it. Eli and Barbara were married for 10 years and they had five children. He owned a thriving hunting goods store and she was well known for the care she took with her home and children and her devotion to her faith. But despite what it looked like to those on the outside, Eli and Barbara were far from happy. In letters she wrote to a church counselor, Barbara wrote about her marriage problems, saying, Where did my friend, love, trustworthy husband go to? He hates me to the core. And in one of her last letters she wrote, I often think of Christ's words, Forgive him, for he knows not what he does. Eli Weaver was a notorious philanderer. He trolled for women online under the username Amish Stud. His profile said, who wants to do an Amish guy? 
And as it turned out, dozens of women did. Messages from usernames like Too Much Ass, 69 Smiley Girl, and Naughty Little Sexy Sex Slave came pouring in, according to the New York Post. And twice during the time he was married, he'd been thrown out and shunned by the elders for his exploits with other women. One time, he was even living with one of his mistresses. But each time, he begged forgiveness and was allowed to return home. But while he was able to give up some of the modern-day amenities he'd come to enjoy, sleeping with other women was not one of them. At home, he ruled his wife and family with an iron fist. He kept his wife on a meager allowance, holding back money for things the kids needed or items he decided weren't necessary. Things he said were frivolous, like ingredients his wife needed to bake pies for church, something that humiliated her, according to the book by Greg Olson and Rebecca Morris called A Killing in Amish Country. Mental abuse was only the beginning. He shoved and hit her whenever he was displeased or frustrated about something. Unexplained marks, scratches, and bruises were found all over her body. But she never complained or reported any of the abuse to her bishop. If she had, questions would have been directed to her, questions about her abilities as a wife. One Amish leader said that she would have been blamed. A typical response in the ultra-traditional community they were a part of was, what did you do to make your husband treat you like that? And the same double standard applied to Eli. After leaving his family before, he knew that if he left, the blame would be on him. If his wife was gone, the community would rally around him in support. In the spring of 2009, Eli thought he had the answer. He needed to find someone willing to get rid of his wife. According to investigators quoted by the New York Post, he floated the idea past several women he was sleeping with, including one woman who he asked to run over his wife only two weeks before she took her last breath, according to the Case Closed podcast. That lady laughed it off, thinking he was making a sick joke. But one person took his request seriously, a 46-year-old woman named Barb Raber. She was raised Amish, so she understood the pressures Eli complained about. She was also married with three kids, but she'd met Eli in her role as the taxi lady. To earn money, she drove the Amish places around where they couldn't go with their traditional horse and buggy. She immediately fell for the much younger Amish man and supplied him with a secret laptop and cell phone. In the fall of 2008, the two of them started meeting up in his barn to sleep together and talk about how to execute his wife. Text messages found between May 30th and June 2nd, 2009 reveal the extent of their diabolical plans. One text exchange went like this. Maybe you could blow up the house, Eli suggested to Barb. In response, she said, what about your kids? To which he said, the kids will go to heaven because they're innocent. Poison was another option, he suggested. Investigators later found 840 Google searches on Barb's computer about poisoning someone. She even sent this text to Eli. I thought if we could get that fly poison in a spice cupcake, she might not detect it. But ultimately, they decided a bullet would be the easiest way to get it done. On June 2, 2009, around 3.30 a.m., police say Barb took a rifle and crept into the Weaver family home through a door in the basement that Eli had left unlocked for her. Before she left, she texted Eli asking him how she should get around his house in the dark, saying, It's too scary. He wrote back that she should take a flashlight. 25 minutes later, she sent another text. I'm scared. Where are you? He told her he was fishing and reminded her not to leave anything behind. That's when police say she made her way to the bedroom where Barbara was sleeping in bed. Later, she would claim that she didn't remember loading the gun and she only wanted to scare her with it. But the gun went off, firing a lethal bullet straight through Barbara's heart. A perfect shot for a woman that would later insist, I never intended for anything to happen, but when it did, it was like, oh crap! Despite his convenient alibi, police were looking at Eli right from the start. It seems his history with other women wasn't as much of a secret as he thought, especially not his connection to Barb Raber. 
On June 9th, a week after the fact, Barb and Eli met in his barn. According to his testimony, she asked him how to clean the rifle so no one could tell that it was fired recently. Before they parted ways, he said she told him she was sorry. The two of them were arrested the next day. In the 250 years the Amish have lived in America, it was only the third time something like this had happened, according to author Greg Olson. In court, Barb's recollection of the event got even worse. She claimed she had no memory of even being in the house and said the text messages found between the two of them were just jokes. And so was the list of poisons detectives found in a notebook in her house. Her attorney argued that Eli had probably done it himself before leaving on his fishing trip. After all, none of Barb's prints were found in the house and the weapon she'd used was also gone without a trace. But Eli cut a deal that meant he testified against her. She got 23 years to life behind bars. Eli managed to walk away with only 15 years to life. And you have to wonder if Barb really did pull the trigger or did Eli conveniently hide behind his Amish identity and convince authorities that he couldn't have been responsible for such a heinous crime. Despite his past history, Eli hasn't given up on love in prison. As inmate number A573-154, he's looking for a pen pal on writeaprisoner.com. His listing reads, Hi, my name is Eli. I'm 40 years old, 6 foot 3, 210 pounds, and I'm hoping to find someone to talk to. It can get rather lonely in here. I'm a small town country boy and am an avid outdoorsman hunting, fishing, and camping. I also really enjoy playing sports, softball, basketball, and volleyball. Before my incarceration, I worked in construction, and up until the last couple of years, I had my own hunting and fishing store. I've been doing mainly maintenance work here in prison. I enjoy working with my hands and building new things. I've also been able to learn about honeybees and how to take care of them. Who would have thought one would be able to do that in prison? I'm currently enrolled in a prison fellowship academy taking classes on Celebrate Recovery, Inside Out Dad, Alpha Program, Life's Healing Choices, and Conflict Resolution. I'm trying to be a better man walking out these doors than I was walking in. I'm also a fitness instructor and teach a couple of workouts as well. I would like to one day have my own gym. Good Lord. He'll be eligible for release in June 2024. Yikes. And that's your recap. Thanks for spending some time with us today. If you like getting twice the crime in half the time, please subscribe and let us know what you think in the comments. You can also subscribe and listen to the show for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We're back here on Sunday for another recap, or you can catch a show on Facebook at True Crime Recaps Videos. Until next time, take care. 